recording oral history interview of Angelo Spano, Spino, pardon me, 119th Armored Engineering Battalion, here at the 12th Armored Division Reunion, 13th of August 2009, Branson, Missouri. So, I want to thank you for seeing, uh, agreeing to sit down and talk to me again. And, uh, well, we're going to start at the beginning and see if anything else uh, Well, jumps Bill, uh, uh, I graduated high school in June of 1943. Uh, at the age of 18, and I had a Army a draftee physical, and I reported for duty uh, the first week of October, um, 1943, at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. And uh, I was inducted and given uniforms to wear and shoes that appropriate attire. And the next morning, we were assigned a, a bunk. And next morning at 4 a.m., some guy's shaking my shoulder. Hey, your name's Spino? I said, yeah, my name's Spino. I said, man, they're going to give me a, make me a PFC or a acting corporal already? The guy says, come with me. Follow me. So I end up on KP the first day in the Army. And the first morning I had to dry six bushels of silverware. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, we took an aptitude test, and I also qualified for the ASTP. So I, was, I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, for a basic training for a 13-week period. And uh, when we took that, we had another aptitude test, and I was assigned to go to University of Oklahoma in Norman and study civil engineering. Well, something happened about that time. They canceled the ASTP program. And so we were at the train station, not knowing the whole battalion, training battalion, 625 guys. And the, the band is playing college songs and everything. So we ended up uh, with the 94th Infantry Division in Camp McCain, Mississippi. All of us. It was an infusion. They were fl fleshing out that division, which... Uh, was uh, assigned to hit the beaches on D-Day. Uh, but someone in Washington who had connections talked to the senators or somebody and said, look, you promise you're going to send all these guys to college and they all end up in the infantry. That's not fair. So they decimated us. That meant every tenth man became a, a, a artilleryman, signal corps engineer. So I, I was one of the lucky ones, and I went to Camp Robinson, Arkansas, and joined uh, the 99th Engineer Maintenance Company, which was a collection of small-town mechanics and that to do welding and repair machinery and trucks and things. So uh, at that time, then they sent me to Maryland to welding school for six weeks. And during that period, D-Day occurred. Uh, and so when I came back, I joined the engineer maintenance company. They had a sharp maneuver in uh, uh, Camp Livingston, Louisiana, and then we went to Kilmer, New Jersey, and shipped overseas on uh, Halloween night, trick or treat. <laughs> <laughs> so we were going up the gangplank with our rifle and duffel bag and et cetera, and we landed in Liverpool where we waited a month for our equipment to catch up with us, and then we did what others do. We went to Weymouth, loaded on LSTs with our equipment in our company, and we went over to the Rouen, to Rouen, up the Seine River, and we were going to sleep out on the pasture there that night, and some guy that had uh, Jeep transportation said, hey, there's a hotel about a mile down the road there, and you can get a room for four bucks. So... Uh, my buddy and I, we said, well, let's go down there. So we hoofed it down there and got a room the first night in France, slept in feather tick beds covered with feather tick mattresses in a lap of luxury. However, we did make it back in time for Reveille. And from thence, uh, our company loaded up and we drove our equipment and trucks to Marseille, France. It was a nice journey across France and down the past Nice, not Nice, but uh, Nancy, uh, to Marseille, where we were engaged. We were billeted in a horse stable and spent Christmas Eve in a manger 
<laughs> of 19, December 1944. Uh, and uh, our main business was overseeing Italian and German prisoners of war unloading boxcars as materiel. And then again, about mid-February, mid-January, after the Battle of the Bulge uh, was occurring, raging, uh, I was chosen to become a uh, a replacement. And uh, then they sent me somewhere in France. I don't know, and gave us a refresher, basic, for six or eight weeks. And then I ended up in Worms, Germany, on the Rhine, about a week after it had been taken. And uh, in a few days then, uh, I was assigned to what turned out to be the 12th Armored Division. And I guess since my MOS said engineer, they put me in the 119th Armored Engineer Company, or Battalion. Uh, and uh, the only thing I can tell you, once we, one time we were allowed to leave the compound in Worms, and they said, now when you go out, take your rifle, take your M1, but they wouldn't give us any ammunition. So here we were walking around Germany with empty guns, uh, because I guess somebody was afraid we'd be trigger happy or something, but that didn't happen. And so then, essentially, I went for a five, four or five week half track ride through southwest Germany. Uh, you know, the first day we got some artillery fire came in and stuff like that, and we just riding along, you know, the artillery would go off 50 feet or 50 yards away and this and that. and then, and one little podunk town after another, all the names sounded. I didn't have a German map. I knew it's within 200 miles where I was, but that's about it. And I remember, I think I reported to the 12th in Baden-Baden, or very shortly before they went through Baden-Baden. So then we worked south easterly, and sometimes we slept in the half track. Sometimes we go in in a house, and we always at night set up our own perimeter defense and uh, that sort of thing. But uh, then another thing, two or three weeks into the fighting, uh, uh, when you would stop the column combat command, you wouldn't know whether you're going to be there two hours or a day, you know. So you start digging. Mother Earth, as you know, is your best friend. So we had a nice foxhole dug, me and my buddy, about four feet wide and three, three and a half feet deep and about two feet wide, thick. and. Uh, a couple of those Messerschmitt jets come over, the 252s, and dropped a couple of bombs each. And one of them knocked out one of our 6 by 6 trucks, shrapnel going through the block. Uh, but the other eventful thing was some battalion surgeon was in the neighborhood, came from nowhere, and jumped in our foxhole right on. He weighed about 230 pounds, and we weighed about 160. And uh, he didn't say thank you or anything. Then he got after the air raid, he left. Uh, say la vie. So then uh, we progressed on, and then I remember we spent the night at the uh, Dillingen Bridge on the prior to crossing. It had already been taken, I guess, and had been uh, a subject of air German air attacks the day before. But uh, apparently they missed the bridge, and we crossed that the next morning and continued on south toward Austria. And I remember then, what was that before? I guess that was before we did ride through München, or Munich, and it was bombed to hell. And I, but as far as direct contact, other than one time, we had to do infantry patrol with a platoon of tanks to make contact between the combat command A and C, or B, whatever we were. and. Uh, and we had to uh, give infantry support to the tanks. And one little gun, it had to be a low caliber gun, shot at those tanks. And they took off like geese and left us standing there. But well, there was no more. Then they didn't fire at us anymore. And, and we caught up to those guys eventually on foot. So that's, that's that. And then uh, after we crossed the Dillingen Bridge, and the we took some prisoners, and uh, I remember one time we uh, captured about uh, 20 or 25 Germans. And they were, by that time, they were ready to capitulate anyway, and they were using horses to carry uh, ammunition and supplies. 
And uh, so when we, these, this officer and these Germans surrendered to our company, um, they turned the uh, horses loose in some guy's backyard. I'd like to have seen his face the next morning when he woke up and saw 20 horses in his backyard. And the guys walked ahead of the uh, half track until we could turn them over to the prisoner detail. To but one nice thing the sergeant did, uh, the officer, he allowed him to ride on the front fender of the half track and gave him a cigarette. <laughs> and uh, subsequent to that, uh, the war just wound down, you know, and I uh, never got shot at again. Say la vie. Oh, one time was pretty scary. We were going across a large pasture, 100 acres or 200 acres, and, uh, and again we were deployed. And, and some planes come over at treetop height. Fortunately, they were P-47s preceding us. But you could see the pilot on waves of the pilot going by. And I uh, shake it in my boots. And then I said, aha, one of ours. And so uh, then we went down the hill. And there was a, they apparently had knocked out a tiger tank down below the ridge. And uh, the guy was leaning out of the turret dead, the German. And, uh, but that was, oh yes, and as we were crossing this, I guess that tank was shooting at us. And you know how they zero in artillery. First they were 75 yards to our left, and then they were 25 yards to our left. I said, we're going to get the next salvo. And it never came, the P-47s, because we were right out in the open. There was a blade of grass there. And, there, and, uh, and the third salvo did not, I guess those planes knocked out that Tiger. And that's about all the action I saw. Well, some would say that's enough. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> well, sir, I want to thank Compared you. Compared to the other guys, well, that's, that's true. minimal. Well, I want to thank you for uh, sitting down and telling me your story. Thank uh, you. Get on digital tape so it'll be there forever. Oh. Thank you, sir. Forever or 90 days, whichever comes first. <laughs> <laughs> that